Welcome to A Thrivable Life, a podcast that shows how everyday people can take everyday actions for a thrivable future where everyone lives in harmony with nature. Hi, I'm Kavya. I'm a project manager by profession and I've lived and worked in Asia, Africa and the Caribbean. Late in my teens, I found a need to reduce uh, my harm on animals as best as I can and I'm still on that journey and I would love to talk about that in this episode. Yeah, and I'm Mike. I'm a research assistant at Thrive with a background in policy and political science. I also have a passion for sustainability to address concerns for the environment, uh, animal rights, as well as social issues that we face. And we are from the Thrive Project, the not-for-profit research institute, think tank and advocacy group. Yeah, and Kavya and I will be your co-hosts as we talk with our special guests about how we can create a thrivable life for all. Uh, before we introduce this week's guest, we would like to recognise Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples as the first peoples of this place, now known as Australia. We respect the elders of the past and present. We are grateful for the continuing care of the land, waterways and skies where we listen, learn and thrive. And today we talk about veganism. You've probably heard this term a lot in the media, but what is it? How does it affect the world and our individual choices? We would like to introduce today's guest, Marcus. Marcus Neves is a scholar based in Rio de Janeiro uh, in Brazil. He is currently pursuing a master's degree in sustainable development and after earning a bachelor's degree in law from the IBMEC. Uh, Marcus is passionate about environmental issues, policy analysis and sustainable development, uh, topics he explores in his academic work. Hi Marcus, welcome to the podcast. Hello Kavya, hello Mike. I'm here to talk a little bit about my insights on veganism and the consequence and my view on that and if I can add something to our knowledge that would be great. It's great to have you here Marcus. Great to have you. So yeah, today's topic is veganism. Um, Just by a bit of a definition, uh, veganism is a way of living which seeks to exclude as far as it's possible and practical all forms of exploitation and cruelty to animals for food, clothing, or any other purposes. And by extension, it promotes the development and use of animal-free alternatives for the benefit of animals, humans, and the environment. So that's the uh, definition that we have from the vegan society. But uh, Mike and Marcus, uh, maybe you could explain what's your personal experience and understanding of what it means to be a vegan or just follow veganism. Yeah, I'd I'd be interested to hear Marcus's view. But yeah, for myself, well, I've technically I've been vegetarian most of my life, and I'm technically vegan now. And I think the biggest reason for myself, at least, was the attempt to um, minimize animal suffering in um, animal agriculture and just a general view of animal welfare. As well as that, it's um, just recognising the level of uh, environmental devastation that the uh, livestock industry and um, using animals for food and resources can have on the environment, along with cruelty-free approaches or living with a plant-based diet. I think it's a way of kind of addressing those things also on a more moral level. So, yeah, I'd be interested to hear what Marcus's view is. So I'm not a vegan and I'm not vegetarian as well, but I think any attempt to try to make the world more sustainable or reduce and most suffering is a valid attempt to do in life because we need it and the more people we have doing it, the better it is. So I like to know that people are engaging in sustainability causes. And I've read about veganism and listened to people that are vegan and have some knowledge on it. and. I always try to ask questions, but what I would say is that depending on the part of the world you're living, it is harder for some people to turn into a vegan diet. For example, me here in Brazil and having had the experience of living in Europe before, I would probably say that it's much harder to be a vegan in Brazil than it is in Europe. Probably because there are more vegans there and they are more into sustainability causes in Europe. So the discussion is broader there and more people are engaged. So the restaurants have to have at least a part of their menu dedicated to vegan people. And there are more people in the close friend cycles that follow this diet. So the influence is bigger. So, like, there's no one single person around my life here in Brazil who is actually vegan. Only some vegetarians and with with some restrictions. And I would probably ask the question of 
how sustainable is your diet? So I always make this question, to make it sustainable, it's not necessarily turning to vegan, but paying attention in the whole food chain and how this food got to your plate. Yeah, I think that's a great question. And personally, for me, I've turned vegetarian maybe half of my life. And I was based in India and it was much easier in India to be vegetarian because a lot of, uh, you know, fruits, vegetables are grown and everybody's diet includes a mix and slightly more easier for me to be. But dairy products, for example, is very essential. And somehow I did not look at it, like you said, as as unsustainable, uh, especially because I've seen where the cows are kept and how they're kept and how their lives are. And that didn't feel as harmful to me um, as as it did. But I still, I think, do eat, for example, I eat eggs. Uh, Once I moved to Australia, it's a little more um, questionable to me. I still now consider if it's actually more uh, sustainable the way I still consume things or not and raises bigger questions for me as well um, yeah but uh, I don't have I think a clear answer to how sustainable my diet is but I think I try to see it was easier for me in India to assess uh, mostly I knew where most of the things came from and in what conditions they were in and how they're being cooked and used and uh, even for that matter the supply chain of how much time it takes to get from a specific area to uh, you know where I live and how long it lasts and how fresh it is and all the you know even energy consumption that goes into for that matter so that's my understanding of how sustainable my diet is but it's a question I have as well I don't know Mike do you have any answers for us yeah well, I think those points are really important in that when you look at it from an individual level and then when you look at it from a, like an industrial level and like what Marcus was uh, talking about too like if we talk about like on a macroeconomic level uh, between countries and it links to um, areas such as like inequalities between our regions as well. If we talk about the global south versus the global north, there have often been a lot of uh, technological innovation issues and disparities between. Uh, so Brazil's not necessarily as much of the global south as other parts, but it might not be as wealthy as you know parts of Europe, for instance, right? But it comes down to things like supply chains and uh, macroeconomics I think and there's a difference in sustainability I think when we talk on an industrial level and factors which are more sort of global and like holistic if we're talking about things like finite resources and um, like strong sustainability for example there are global incentives I think on an industrial level for plant-based or vegan industry But there is always going to be that factor of inequality between regions which needs to be mitigated in itself and to make it more available for um, areas like, you know, if you look at particularly developing countries like within Africa, for example, even more so, there's a lot of issues there because of uh, agriculture in itself and what innovations can be used to address the food consumption requirements. And there's a whole range of complexity there. But I think uh, when we look at it through the strong sustainability or finite resources perspective, we can see that globally, if these uh, inequalities between nations are addressed, there can definitely be incentives, at least for the environment and um, for public health when you look at it. Even if we're just talking about meat consumption, like livestock for um, meat consumption, I mean, a huge driver of deforestation, like in Brazil, like in the Amazon. There was a study recently talking about how if there was a rapid phase out of animal agriculture, it can reduce uh, greenhouse gas emissions to 50% of what is required by the end of this century alone. That's without even addressing oil or gas. And um, another study indicated that, you know, animal agriculture are likely to use 80% of the allowable greenhouse gases budget within the next 30 years alone. So that's 80% of what animal agriculture can use up uh, within the next 30 years. It's severe, uh, the impact. Another study indicated that uh, animal agriculture is expected to overtake oil and gas as the number one contributor to greenhouse gases within the next 30 years, if left unmitigated also. Currently, it's the third biggest cause of greenhouse gas emissions, about, I think it's between 25 and 30%. If left unmitigated, it's expected to overtake oil and gas in less than three decades. So there's obviously a huge impact on deforestation, on climate change, And on public health, things like um, zoonotic diseases, you know, we've had COVID, we've had a whole range of zoonotic diseases from, you know, bird flu to swine flu to 
SARS in recent years. And all of these are connected to the, you know, industrial scale animal agriculture. And we've seen the impact of that. We've seen the impact of these pandemics, as well as things like um, antibiotic resistance through, you know, the unscrupulous use of that for uh, staving off infections and allowing growth uh, within livestock to be facilitated more easily. And that's a really worrying threat to public health. I think up to something like 70% of the antibiotics that are commonly used for people to treat uh, infections within hospitals are used within animal agriculture. So if there's immunity to these um, antibiotics, that has huge impacts for for public health. Yeah, and I think, Marcus, you were talking about also having like animal cruelty perspective to it if you take away, I think, Mike, you spoke about uh, impact on sustainability and a climate change perspective, public health. But there is an angle of animal cruelty. There is an aspect of looking at more of the philosophical or the Anthropocene perspective of it. So just going back to what Mike was saying about the food production and greenhouse emissions and this large scale production of food. So uh, what I think is important for people who are concerned about having a sustainable diet is that you look into what transitions are being made in a certain place. They were, for example, doing animal-based food production. And so they use technology to replace it with plant-based food production. So many attempts out there of making it a sustainable way of producing food. And if we are concerned about having a sustainable diet, we should care about having in our labels that our food was produced in a sustainable manner and so many different ways of doing that. So I would say that just turning vegan probably statistically makes your diet more sustainable, but you should also look at how is your food being produced. And that's another way of looking at this thing. And one more thing is that why is it hard? And it's a social justice aspect as well, because like, for example, here in Brazil, even though Brazil is super invested in the globalization, the knowledge on how to transition to a diet, because it's difficult to have a vegan diet, because the mainstream is animal-based foods. And I know so many people who want to transition to a vegan diet, but there are so many hurdles in the way to do that because people are not doing it around them, because they don't know which foods to consume and which foods to buy and have a healthy diet as well. And when they go to nutritionists, most of them will recommend a balanced diet that includes a little bit of animal-based food as well. So, and making it not as expensive as the food they would if they were following the mainstream type of food production. So I, I know that because Europe, for example, is more engaged, they have more access to knowledge. And because I'm kind of engaged in the discussion, I've seen videos of people explaining how you can have a perfectly healthy diet as well as even cheaper than an animal-based diet. But that's because I kind of have the privilege of having access to this type of information. But we have to think this all thinking about the average person. And I know for sure, like uh, we are here talking about that, but like most of people in Brazil, like probably more than 70% of them don't even know about this whole discussion and why it's sustainable. So having access to the information on why you should be vegan and why is it more sustainable and why animal suffering is a bad thing and we don't want to do that. And a high percentage of people don't even consider that animals do suffer. They don't even have this concept in their minds. So to convince them of why veganism is important, we have to raise so many questions and explain and educate people on all these things like, why is it more sustainable? If you do that, you will have this result and that result. And when you see the reward you're doing by changing your diet, you will probably be more motivated. And I come from a law background and it always sounded weird for me that in a law perspective, in a judicial perspective, animals are seen as things. And that's so weird for me. And 
even if in a practical way you can argue that it doesn't make a big difference. But just to have this concept, it wouldn't enable us to make the questions to think them in a different perspective because the system is so ingrained in this idea that we are one thing and animals are another thing and that we suffer in a special way and they don't even suffer or if they suffer it doesn't really matter so that's why when we talk about the animal suffering perspective we should bring people who have close contact with animals who raise them closer to the average person who don't see it because they probably have some insights and they see the suffering, they see the perception of the world. And it's kind of clear that they have a certain level of consciousness. And it's weird for me to know that people don't even have this concept in their mind. So how will we find a solution for that? I agree. And I think that's a big question, right? Like, for example, some of these documentaries that come out and they did come out for a while or people see videos of violence towards certain animals that they like. It sometimes makes them realize that there is a hypocrisy to what they do, which is there are animals that they're okay with eating, but there are those that are not okay with getting harmed. But how I felt like in my experience, it also, like you mentioned, comes down to the cost of accessibility of food. There is nutrition it's very hard to maintain given your current diet and hence they go to the most convenient thing. And in a lot of cases, I even I have like a lot of my family and friends and most people eat, uh, used to grow up in that environment as well. And they usually do want to be away from the source. So they kind of at the back of their mind know that this is real, that there are animals being hurt, etc. But they want to stay as away from possible. So if they ever had to really go and kill that animal and then consume it, they would not do it. But they, wouldn't, they do want to be away from it. Uh, so it, it is a moral, I think, there for people who are conscious, partially. But it is not fully ingrained into a life choice. And especially because a lot of people do have pets. So they do understand, right, that pets are almost considered like, you know, a child by a lot of people. So it is, I think, personal ease with which we see. But also talking about cultural practices, I think if, if we do look at a lot of indigenous cultures, there is a different kind of respect even in the cultures that do consume from given the environment that they lived in. There is a different kind of consciousness and understanding of animal suffering. So I feel like that is an angle which is also important to bring out. But today, a lot of people live in a very different way and we don't respect, I think, the animals the same way we did before. It's how we conceptualize animals in our industrial society. And they were not important to be seen as a living being, and they were more seen as things. And that's why we don't even allow the questioning to conceptualize them as something more equal to us than they probably are. Like you talked about implementing indigenous knowledge for that. I was doing this research for wolf reintroduction case and wolves were driven to extinction in Canada because of farmers hunting them because they wanted to keep their sheep safe and there was a whole narrative created because of the wolves and they were seen as villains and some of the narratives were even say that they were demons something like that and that would justify them to extinguish the wolves of the place. And the indigenous people had this perspective of the wolves being part of the environment. And that's something we can reintroduce in the world we live in right now and that we are not doing. I think it's a really interesting point that's being made here like uh, by Marcus. Uh, talking about the way in which narratives are formed or the conceptions that we have, including some of the more traditional people's um, viewpoints in many instances where there is higher respect, not always, but in many, like you're talking about in parts of the Americas, uh, traditional cultures, where there has been a lot of respect by comparison. But I think the general conception that we have, particularly in industrial or developed countries, even as Marx pointed out, uh, even in law in many instances, seeing animals in many countries as, as property going back to, you know centuries in many regards you know that has a huge impact in the way in which the morality is seen and what can be 
seen as justified in the same way as demonising certain animals, like particular animals that we use for consumption. They might be seen in a particular way. They're seen as stupid or as dirty or whatever it is, like, you know, you can see. The same way as, like, wolves were demonised as as bad, um, you know, pigs or whatever might be seen as dirty. You know, so animals can be perceived in a particular way. So it doesn't matter what we do to them. But I think in a lot of ways, you know, there is a lot of consciousness and people are aware when they get exposed to animals but exposed to the suffering that they might be subjected to. But I think cultural narratives is a big part of it and some of the public actors, you know, within industry are kind of reliant on peddling viewpoints or preventing a kind of exposure or narratives which expose what some of the abuses within industry. And I think, you know, this is something which uh, there have been different organisations which have been trying to look at both legally and um, you know, commercially how to implement sort of plant-based diets but also, you know, promoting animal welfare. And when you look at, you know, the history of development, I see personally like a strong correlation between like animal rights and human rights. I mean, they're both based on the same issues. There have been economic incentives for abuses towards humans in the past you know you, you don't have to look too far back to see horrific treatment of people for an economic gain and the narratives that get spun around that but also some of the advances towards protecting human rights from the most horrific abuses have been conjunctive in many ways to ideas and philosophies concerned with animal welfare and animal rights you know you only have to look at um, certain organisations like the RSPCA or the Royal Society of uh, Prevention of Cruelty to Animals. And you know, that was um, based uh, originally in the UK, but also in Australia. But that had um, its origins in like, people who were slave trade abolitionists, for example, ending horrific treatment of people. Let's protect animals as well. So, so, you know, there's a lot of morality. Even you go back to ancient Greece, some of the founders of Western civilization in terms of theory and philosophy, you know, many of the most prominent Greek philosophers were promoting animal welfare and animal rights and were you know, vegetarian or vegan. So it's very conjunctive, I think, to uh, what we would call as the higher attributes of, you know, morality and uh, civilization, or what, you know, conjunctive with human rights, I think, too. It comes down to narratives and the way in which we conceptualize things. And I think there are definite interests involved to not promote the welfare of animals because it can interfere with industry and there might only be a small portions of the population doing this but it can have a big impact um, in terms of negating any progress towards animal welfare because when we have concerns for animal welfare that can impact on profitability for certain industries because they are reliant on practices which have a turnover of profit for those companies but extremely abusive at the same time. Yeah, and another area I think we didn't uh, get to cover too much was not just diets, right? There's also products that continue to be continued to use, but there have been a lot of strides done, I would say, in the past few decades to really bring down whether it's uh, oil extraction from certain animals or even products of, say, leather products and others that we use. That, I think, also globally is changing a little bit. But I think from a sustainability perspective, the alternatives to a lot of the leather products, for example, are sometimes not the most sustainable products or they are plastic-based. So I think there's a little more openness for quite a few people to adopt the products, but it does come with similar um, arguments as well. And just uh, given the time, I think there's so much we can speak even more about it. But I was wondering if there are specific ideas or suggestions you have for listeners about how we can, if somebody wants to change, what are the areas that they can consider and if there are any sources that they can look at. So it could be, uh, say, from a nutrition perspective that we spoke about, it could be about animal cruelty, it could be about your local, looking at your local supply chains or any other areas. So do you have any areas you want to mention? Uh, uh, given what we said here, I wanted Mike to explain us a little bit how to successfully turn into a vegan diet because that's something that is probably challenging for me to do and having a balanced, healthy diet as well as vegan and from his perspective and where he lives in and how accessible the knowledge and these foods are in his region and it could maybe compare it to me. But in terms of how I think we can contribute to having a more sustainable diet or reduce animal suffering, everything we discussed here. I think 
it's what I kind of said in the beginning, is that we sh should establish the discussion before reducing animal suffering. Because when we say we want to reduce animal suffering, and that is important, and the question is, why is it important? And do they suffer? Do they have consciousness? And what level of consciousness do they have? Is it as important as ours? Why we give all these human rights to humans? Why do they deserve it? When we ask these questions and we have the answers that animals do suffer, that they do have consciousness in different levels, and maybe they can experience suffering even more than we do because we don't know how they experience the world. Then knowing why we should avoid animal suffering, we can then promote avoidance of animal suffering. But we should, before that, educate people that they are not properties, they are not things that live out there, they experience the world as much as we do. Uh, establishing this principle is important because people will be more likely to be convinced on engaging in a more sustainable diet or avoiding animal suffering in the different aspects of life. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, just to respond to what Marcus was uh, saying, or to begin with, I think there's definitely a few factors like if we're talking about animal welfare and animal suffering, uh, even on a like epistemological or early philosophical level, I think it was Pythagoras or Plutarch and actually Grace who, you know, talked about animals having souls and that animals um, are capable of suffering. And, you know, these were founders of mathematics, like Hippocrates, early father of medicine, I think it was. And these ideas go back over two millennia. But there's been like a recent uh, legislation in the UK recognising animal sentience, talking about that, yes, animals do suffer. So that's in law in the UK now. It was sort of unprecedented. I think there have been a couple of examples but that is a pretty solid one talking about, yes, animals, including some of the smallest, even invertebrates, types of life forms, including sea creatures and so forth, can suffer. And that's in legislation now in the UK. So I think that was our last year that came in. So that's another good example, a good precedent to have. But I think there's a whole bunch of factors. Now, just to the second point of well, what Marcus had asked about, you know, in terms of transitioning to a vegan diet, I think there's a whole range of factors to consider. I think for me, most importantly, looking at it through the lens of having better animal welfare laws is probably the most important thing as opposed to looking at uh, technically what each individual can do to be strictly vegan and looking at every single thing that they eat. I think for myself, it's like not eating meat is probably one of the biggest things. But I think the discussion really needs to be mostly on an industrial or not just on an individual level, but like on a societal level and the way in which narratives get formed and industry can be like legitimised. And I think we need to look at it more on that level. Otherwise, you do, like as mentioned before, you have inequalities between regions. The accessibility to, let's say, plant-based meat or whatever it is, or even developing cell-based meat as well, uh, isn't necessarily currently there. But I think, you know, there have been studies showing that GDP... For countries, there's no indication of any loss of GDP in transitioning to plant-based agriculture. Uh, similarly, for producers, there's no indication. Like studies have shown there's a neutral impact, but there needs to be government incentives for producers to change what they are producing uh, in agriculture. And there needs to be guidelines from government at policy level. And as well as that, we need to engage with the media because, you know, we've basically got corporations who are influencing things and I think on a corporate level if that can change if companies are able to get on board with that or at least a challenge to be accountable to the fact that th these practices these operations are devastating I think we need to change the narratives when it comes to the media and in and in policy and I think that will make it easier for people particularly in areas where it's currently harder to have accessibility because of the existing industry and what foods are available it's vital that um, on an industrial level, those things are addressed. And I think supporting campaigns internationally is important and doing what we can on an individual level, but just recognising that this really you know, it ties to systems thinking, that what we need to do is look at it on a macro level as well and hold governments, uh, policymakers and companies to account because 
they can influence not only what happens in the developed world, but what can happen so far as like inequality between regions and developing countries where there would be incentives for transitioning to this industrially. But I think too much emphasis is put on individuals. I think individuals should do what they can to go cruelty free or say, okay, I'm trying to minimise animal suffering, let's support stronger animal welfare laws for every, you know, whether it's sea creatures to livestock in factory farms or pets or whatever. At the same time, it's um, doing what you can, but trying to support these campaigns. Yeah, absolutely. We are a little out of time. And I think Marcus's question about really looking at how to kind of change your habits and still meet your nutrition limits could be a whole different topic. I think we can probably have a discussion on and um, even see if we can get somebody who's also has experience in, in nutrition to talk to us about it because we've I think I've definitely struggled with that but I started quite early so I was able to take some time to get to a better level. Thanks for uh, joining today Mike and Marcus there's so much we can uh, take back from this conversation hopefully and also have future conversations on it. Thank you. Yeah thank you Marcus and, and Kavya that was a really interesting discussion. Thank you guys it was a pleasure to join you. Thank you so much stay tuned and keep on thriving.